Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. A few years ago, I made a video called the Top 5 Annoying Computing Things, which people continue to watch and to comment on to list their own pet hates in the world of computing. And so, in this video, I thought I'd wade back into the discussion with five more of my own annoying computing things, and I'm going to list these in the hope that at some point they might actually be fixed. Guess what? At number 5 on my list we have thin scroll bars. The scroll bars in modern operating systems and applications which keep getting thinner and thinner and thinner and hence more difficult to use. And I'm sure some people will say, Chris, just use the mouse scroll wheel. Well, I'd say two things to that. One, not all rodents have a scroll wheel. And secondly, even when they do, using a scroll wheel is nowhere near as accurate as clicking on and dragging a scroll bar. Now, some operating systems, Linux Mint being a good example, you can go in these days and find a setting and make the scroll bar a decent width. But that's by no means common in all situations where a thin scroll bar exists. So please, 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 if you are designing a user interface, make sure either you use a thicker scroll bar or have an option available so that those of us who want to actually use the scroll bar rather than just look at it as a nice visual accessory, make sure those of us who want to use a thicker scroll bar have an option for selecting the same. Right, next on my list we... Oh, sorry, we've been interrupted. We just need to click a OK here. There we are, we can continue. As I was saying, Next on my list, we have cookie consent messages, which drive me mad. Those requesters that appear on websites so frequently these days to basically say, this website uses a basic web technology, are you okay with that? Now, cookies are small bits of data which are stored on a user's machine by a website to enable personalization, session management for things like e-commerce websites, and also to track people with online advertising. And I understand that because of the latter in particular, some people really don't like cookies. I get that. That's not what I'm complaining about, because if you don't like cookies, you can simply go into your browser settings and turn all cookies off. And given that is an option, I find it intensely frustrating that the rest of us have to go on clicking on this cookies, do you mind cookies? Yes, I don't mind cookies, click on it every time we visit websites. There are billions of visits to websites every day, probably, where people are clicking on a cookie consent message. That is an enormous amount of human time being wasted when the people who really don't like cookies have probably turned them off anyway, and everyone else doesn't really care, or they don't read it. You know, I, I automatically just click yes regardless these days, because I just, if I want to go to a website, I want to go to the website, I'm going to use it. So please, 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 can all those regulators who've decided they want to nanny us into being careful with cookies on every single site rather than turning them off universally in our browser, Please, can those regulators change those laws? Can we go back to a situation where we can all use websites, stop wasting our time, and be a little bit calmer in our use of the web? Staying with things online, at number three on my list, I've got bloated web content. Or in other words, websites and web pages that seem to be written without any consideration of the bandwidth and computing resources available to the average user. Now here, I'm not complaining about sites like, say, YouTube or Netflix or Disney+, Plus, where you go to watch HD video. And if you click on an HD video, you know you're going to use a lot of bandwidth. That's fine. You know what you're going to get when you use the site. Rather, my complaint is with websites and web pages, which are basically text documents, maybe a few images around as well. But when you load in the page, they bring in massive image files, far bigger than the images they need to display on the page. And they load in loads and loads of code, JavaScript, something like that, often not terribly well written. And sometimes these days, increasingly these days, web pages start to play video files, either as discrete videos or part of their background. So there's masses of data use and computing resources tied up with that web page. And at best it makes the page slow to load, and at worst it makes the page unusable 
on an older piece of hardware. So this is bad for the user experience, it's bad for the person writing the site. I remember when we started to have the web building up, what, 20 years ago now, and one of the great things about the early web is it forced programmers to write efficient code. They got used to writing highly inefficient code to run locally on our computers because we got so much RAM and so high level of computing resources that they could just write sloppy code here, there and everywhere. Microsoft and everybody downwards were doing that. But the web was somewhere you had to think about what did you really need to transfer to the user's machine because internet speeds were slow. And therefore, the web was the place you found efficient coding, efficient programming. But these days, that is no longer the case to the great detriment of the usability of, of the web experience. So please, if you are writing web content, web pages, think about optimizing your images, optimizing your code, your JavaScript, etc. And please, please do not start video content playing unless the user has specifically requested it. Next, here I've got two leads. And these leads have got various things in common. They're both fairly new. They've both got on one end a full-size HDMI connector, a plug or a socket. And they've both on the other end got, wait for it, a micro HDMI connector. And the final thing both of these leads have in common is that neither of them work reliably, even though they're quite new leads. Why? Well, I've already told you it's because both of these leads have got a micro HDMI connector at one end. And to put it nicely, micro HDMI connectors are rubbish. They simply are too small for the function that's asked of them. Now, in saying this, I should point out I am quite unusual in many respects, but particularly in this context, I'm unusual because I plug in and take apart HDMI connections all the time when I'm making videos plugging together cameras, computers, mixers, splitters, recorders, that type of stuff. So I can be making scores of HDMI connectors and pulling them apart every day. That's not how most people use an HDMI connector. But even so, in use, I find that full-size HDMI connectors handled carefully will last for years and years, whereas micro HDMI will last, if you're lucky, for months, which is really not good. And this affects lots of different things. For a start, it affects single board computers these days. The Raspberry Pi 4 and some other single board computers now use a micro HDMI connector. But also, my laptop, like most laptops these days, has a micro HDMI connector. And this is the laptop that I take out to make presentations with big clients, or I used to before the world changed. And I've had lots of problems plugging in to micro HDMI. But the laptop I used before that, which was slower and bulkier and heavier, but it had a full-size HDMI connector and a VGA connector, and neither of those connectors ever gave me any trouble at all. So I'm one of those people who'd much rather have a slightly thicker device if it could have a reliable display connector. Maybe we could use mini HDMI connectors, which are still quite small, but massively better as connectors than, than micro HDMI. Do you get the feeling I really don't like micro HDMI? Well, I don't. And so I hope micro HDMI connectors are something I'll see a lot less of in the future. Right, we've now reached the top of my list. And to celebrate, I thought we'd bring in Mr. Scissors and Stanley a knife, and also a rather large drill. Very exciting, I always like using a, a drill. And why am I showing you these? Well, it's because these are tools I use a lot. And when I use these tools, when I put them away after I've used them, and I come back to them a few hours later, or days later, or weeks later, they function in exactly the same way as they did when I put them away. Why do I mention this? Well, it's because if you use, say, the Windows 10 operating system and you leave it and come back to it, it sometimes doesn't function in the same way it did when you, you last left it because of automatic feature updates. And so number one on my list of the top five more annoying computing things is automatic feature updates. When a piece of software, an operating system or an application 
goes online, updates itself without asking you, and then has different features to what it had when you last used it. And of course, often in the case particularly of Windows, what really happens is you turn on your machine, go to do a piece of work, have to wait for a considerable amount of time while whilst Windows messes itself up, you have to sort it out again, get on with the work, and it still doesn't function exactly as it did when you last used it. I, I find this intensely annoying. Partially it's linked to the fact that, of course, Windows 10 is not an operating system. It's a number of operating systems that changes twice a year to be a different operating system. And Microsoft takes things out and adds things in, gives us new features, apparently, which many of us didn't want in the first place. It's extraordinary. I can't think of any other area of product or services where you buy something and you use it and its features change without any consultation with the user, often for the worse. We know that recently updates to Windows 10 have been breaking things more and more and more. Why can't they leave things alone? I accept we need updates and potentially automatic updates a lot of the time for things like security patches. That is completely different to changing the functionality of an operating system or a piece of software. And this isn't just Windows 10, even some Linux distros have a habit of doing things a bit like this now. And you look at software like, for example, Adobe's Creative Cloud Suite, where you're not allowed to use a fixed version of the software. You have to keep updating regularly because it's part of the agreement. And this worries me going forward because at the moment, this just affects operating systems and applications. Don't waste a lot of our time. But have we got used to a world where we think it's okay constantly for software products to be updated? Because if that is the case, what will happen when we start to use more and more AI, when we start to use robots in the home and in the workplace more, when we have autonomous vehicles, where we think it's okay for them to be feature updated without the user asking. I very much hope not. And so please, 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 anybody selling or renting, I guess these days, a piece of software, can we turn off, can we make optional automatic feature updates? And so there we are, five more entries on my list of annoying computing things. But what aggravates you when you're using computers? Please let us all know down in the comments section. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.